Did you know that science can be a great diplomatic tool? Think about any global challenge we are facing today. Climate change, epidemics, biodiversity loss, water scarcity, air pollution, plastics in the ocean. All of these challenges have at least three elements in common. They have scientific and technological dimensions, both to understand them or to address them. They cross national borders, and no country or sector will be able to solve them on its own. Now, traditionally, the worlds of science and diplomacy have occupied very different orbits. But I hope to convince you today that by bringing them together, we can improve the way we approach and address our most pressing challenges. I grew up on a Spanish island in the middle of the Mediterranean. Like many islanders, since I was a little girl, I had a deep longing to see the world. I soon discovered that pursuing a scientific career was one of the best ways to travel and to have an international adventure. So I trained to become a molecular biologist in laboratories and universities across four different continents. Science became my passport, my way of life. And everywhere I went, I worked with scientists from all different nationalities, backgrounds, cultures, political ideologies, religions, I realized that science was the one language we all had in common, no matter where we came from. And so I thought, why not leverage this power of science, this universal language, to bridge some of the differences that so often keep us from understanding each other? This, in a nutshell, is the concept of science diplomacy, the idea that science can help us which divides between countries and, and nations, especially when they have difficult political or diplomatic relations. This resonated so much with my own experience as a scientist in a multicultural environment. So I decided to hang my lab coat for a while and replace my laboratory bench for a cubicle in the 25th floor of the United Nations headquarters in New York City. As I walked through the 193 flags and into that iconic building, I soon realized that there were not many scientists like me. And this was not only intimidating and daunting at a personal level, it was very much but it was also the symptom of a larger problem, because more and more, the issues at the top of our international agenda have complex scientific and technological dimensions. But I realized, sitting in those UN meetings, the profound divide between the scientific and the diplomatic communities. So I decided to dedicate my career to building bridges between them. For example, I worked on a science cooperation program between the United States and Cuba, two countries that had no diplomatic relations since 1961, but however shared many common challenges, for example, tropical infectious diseases or environmental disasters. Despite not having diplomatic relations, scientists from both countries managed to work together to address those challenges, there was some common ground that science could help them uh, come towards. As a result of this program, when the two countries resumed, re-established diplomatic relations in 2015, bilateral scientific agreements were the first to be officially signed between the two governments. But we don't need to go that far to understand this concept of science diplomacy. Here in Geneva, I'm sure you all know about CERN, the International Physics Laboratory. CERN was created after World War II 
by a handful of scientists who saw an opportunity to bridge the two Europes, the divided Europe, and reintegrate through science. Another example that I love very much, because I was there a few years ago, is Antarctica. The Antarctic Treaty, signed in 1959 at the height of the Cold War, by 12 nations who recognized the need to preserve the white continent as an international reserve, an international laboratory, dedicated exclusively to peace and science, what we call a global common. And that means that science became effectively the form of governance in Antarctica. So what is it that makes science such a good tool for diplomacy and peace building? It is not just about scientific knowledge. It is also about scientific thinking. Scientists all around the world use the same principles for their research. They work together collecting data through experimentation. They validate their results openly with their peers. They remove biases. They build consensus. Those are very valuable characteristics to apply to the conduct of international relations. And the values of science, of universality, or rationality, transparency, are the same all over the world, here in Geneva, in Japan, in South Africa, or in Brazil. The laws of the natural world are the same for all of us. And this is what we can leverage to improve our relationships when other aspects and other factors of our engagement are not so aligned. So when we want to tackle a problem that crosses borders, why not bring more scientists to help us bring the shared evidence that we need to then make our political decisions based on them? For example, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, it's an intergovernmental organization made of scientists from more than 100 countries that every few years they publish a consensus report on the latest climate science. Because how do we decide if we need to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees or 4 degrees? These are not arbitrary values. Scientists help us build the models and the predictions and tell us what will happen in each of these scenarios if we let global warming reach those levels. The IPCC is a very interesting organization because it is not a research institute, it's not a physical building sitting somewhere. It is an intergovernmental organization. And because of this unique international collaboration, it was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2017. But perhaps not the Nobel Prize that you are thinking, not the Science Prize, but the Peace Prize. But coming back to reality and today, we are facing the COVID-19 pandemic. And this pandemic unfortunately has shown us that we are still far from basing or informing our decisions on the best, on the best available evidence. And this weakens our ability to address global challenges that are more and more growing in scientific and technological complexity. Because no matter how ambitious one country's policies are to phase out fossil fuels, to stop dumping plastics in the ocean, to contain the spread of a virus, if the neighboring countries do not follow, those efforts will be futile. And this is what requires diplomacy. So what can we do? My one piece of advice and ask that I have for you, especially in a place like Geneva, in a school like this one, the Graduate Institute, is to start bringing more scientists to the diplomatic table. Because we need to update the tools and the tactics and the techniques of foreign policy to adapt to this world of increasing scientific and technological complexity, where science and technology are driving geopolitical reconfigurations and are becoming 
the source of new conflicts. So to the scientists in the room, I encourage you to venture outside the lab to explore the many ways you can have an impact, perhaps unconventional ways, in diplomacy and international relations. Don't be afraid to be the only one in the room like I was in those uh, meetings at the United Nations. But make sure you are not the last. So make space for others to come after you. To the diplomats in training, I know there are many in this audience. I also encourage you to embrace the value that science can br scientists can bring to your table. Embrace science for the future of multilateralism, and together, scientists and diplomats, you will lead the future world. Thank you very much. <laughs>